Well, Lord, we are grateful for your grace and mercy. Thank you for leaving us here with a, with a roadmap. Mechanics, how do we do this? Where are we going? What's to be our motive? Why are we doing what we're doing? How do we get there? <clears throat> got We gotta have the how do we get there part. And so help us with that tonight. Use this time in our life and our country as an opportunity for us to share the Lord's word and his gospel and, and a relationship with him. Give us the courage to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, we're in Colossians 1, and we've been there forever, and I, I'm going to get through with it maybe this time or the next and then push on with it. But I noticed that in Colossians 1, 9, he talks about, this is Paul's prayer for these believers. He said that you need to be filled with the knowledge of his will, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then he says, when you have that wisdom and understanding, it will enable you to walk worthy, pleasing God in every way, walking worthy of the Lord, pleasing him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. In verse 9, you see the, the emphasis on knowledge of God and the Lord, epinosis. You know, many of you know that word. It's an important word. And then walking worthy pleasing God in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. And then he says, increasing in the epinosis of God. So he's back to knowledge. And so what I see there is a cycle where you begin your life learning, taking in the word of God, coming to understand, and then you start using it in your life. And as you begin to do that, you begin to need more knowledge. So as you are making the walk, learning to please the Lord, bearing fruit. You, you need more knowledge and consistently needing to be reminded and encouraged and continue learning. There's a huge, huge bottomless pit of learning in the Christian life. Now there is a point of substantially having the program in mind and it takes a long time to get there and some very good teachers to, to communicate it some people that are gifted to do that, who are educated to do that. And hopefully I'm one of those people, but I'm more of a niche type person. So the Lord has led me to a niche and it's to talk about these types of things more than anything else. So now we're going to get into this spiritual growth and talk about the fact the Bible uses metaphors. Metaphors are the way that we take a human daily example from our life and, and it, compare it with something spiritual to teach spiritual ideas. Well, the Bible uses a lot of metaphors, like the farming metaphor we talked about a few weeks ago. Uh, it, it uses the metaphor of the shepherd and the sheep. Uh, Jesus is called a door, different things like that. Uh, in fact, you'll it, the, the deeper you get into language itself, the more you understand that much of what we say or really let metaphors, but the metaphor we're going to use is one of human growth and development. This is probably the primary one used in the Bible to describe spiritual growth. And we have five words that are used to describe spiritual growth. And I, we taught them last time. Uh, the brephos is the baby on the breast. The napios is the toddler, or excuse me, the crawlers. At my wife's work, they call them crawlers. And the pice level, this is the third level. These are like the toddlers. Then you become a technon, which is like first grade. Technon means a child under training, under discipline and training. So this is when you, you begin to have a school day and you begin to have regimented classes and you come under training. Now, this is a Christian life training. This is Christian life. This is foundational stuff. See, in the first three stages, you're getting foundation, eternal security. Who am I in Christ? All of the 50 things that you get at salvation, all of those doctrines you begin to learn and begin to see yourself as who you are in Christ. Now, it may take longer to really get that fully in your soul, but one day you realize I'm no longer the person I used to be that I thought I was. I'm this person in Christ. God sees me in Christ not as a collection of successes and failures in my human life. He sees me in Christ. I'm righteous in Christ, as righteous as Jesus. But 
once you get the foundation, then the Lord says, time to walk. Just like any child growing up, you know, time to walk, time to begin to move, time to learn these skills, time to go to school. Well, the technon's when you go to school. And in the Jewish culture, the next level is called a huios. This is what Jesus is called, the adult son of God. And this is an adult. In their culture, that was 13 years old. So when a boy uh, went out of his mother's home, he went with his father, and he learned that trade. He, he worked with he was his father's helper learning the trade. So Jesus learned the carpentry trade. Paul learned the tent-making trade. They all learned a trade of some kind to be able to get by no matter what. So we're in one of those stages. Now, a huios is an adult stage, but it's not necessarily mature. I've got young children. I mean, I've got uh, children 20, 21 years old, and they're technically adults, but I wouldn't call them mature. They have a long way to go. And I remember being that age, and I was thinking I was all that, but I, I, I didn't even know how to fall down yet, let alone pick myself back up. Now, just like normal growth, we grow spiritually in stages and cycles. And each stage is designed to develop new skills and new strengths, has its share of specific hurdles uh, that only this new knowledge. See, this is what Paul's saying. You get this knowledge of God's desire for you. And this is not the old, this is not the plan of God. This is the desire of God for you. And so, and there's a difference. And so you you get this insight and understanding and wisdom, and you begin to walk. And as you begin to walk, you begin to run into all these hurdles and all these dead ends, and you begin to make all these mistakes. You have to pick yourself back up constantly, and you need more knowledge. You're like, I've learned how to walk, but I don't know where I'm going or how to even do this, or why do I keep bruising myself? Why do I keep falling and failing? Well, you need more knowledge. So you keep going. And as you keep going through these different stages, each stage requires knowledge and understanding, and then you work to develop skills and strength. Just like a little kid, that's, that's, he start learning to crawl. Well, he's not strong enough yet to pull himself up and get on his feet. But in just a little while, he, he'll develop the strength to pull himself up and get on his feet. And uh, so... Uh, the third point was each stage development has four things, a need and desire, something that we put our faith in or expectation to meet that need and desire, a strategy to accomplish meeting that desire, and then fourthly, challenges and hurdles to overcome. Every stage of life has challenges and hurdles. And some of you are older than I am, some of you are not. And what I've learned, what I realized this time is that God uses the normal challenges of life that come for the believer and the unbeliever. The believer doesn't get uh, a pass on the normal challenges of life. We get sick. We, our loved ones get sick. People struggle, et cetera, et cetera. We, we have to go through the door of death all of these challenges. So every stage has its challenges. Just like you grow up and you have all these challenges of learning how to relate to other people and how to develop a career and find a place in the world and you get married and the challenges of marriage and then children and all the things that go on. Your parents get old and you have to take care of them and then they die and now it's your turn to get to that stage. And so all of these are normal challenges and God uses every bit of that for our growth to, to force us to develop greater strength to get over the hump. So uh, this is a divinely designed pattern. All of these things, listen, God didn't create all of these challenges for us. Adam sin did that, but God allowed it. And now God's gonna use it <clears throat> to, as our, listen, as our obstacle course, this is our growth course, this is our obstacle course, God is using all of the challenges in our life, in your life, whatever you're facing right now, whatever you just got through facing, 
Uh, Cindy, you need to look at your email. Uh, and you have notes in the email. And so I lost my train of thought. Yeah, the challenges are the normal ones of life. And we all, we, God uses every bit of that. Adam's sin has caused us to get old and to have health problems and to lose our loved ones. I mean, it was Adam's sin that caused death, spiritual death, needing us to be saved, physical death, needing us to, um, forcing us to go through physical death. I.e. So God uses all these challenges. It's a divinely divine system. So what's the point here? The point before I go on is that God's in control of this. He's, he's in control of this. And there's no question that you can just relax. There's a net under you. You're not walking the tightrope without a net. No matter what happens, he's going to catch you. You feel like you're walking over the cliff, and yet he's going to—he's there to, to hold you up and let you walk across. So all of this is pre-planned. All of this is known. All of this, he already knows what you're going to do and how you're going to do with it. He's egging you on. He's encouraging you. He's saying, you can do this. I don't mean to sound like Joel Osteen, but, I mean, there's a lot of truth in all that. To have this positive look at what God's doing in your life instead of focusing on the negative, wow, what a great thing. So, so this is will be the fifth principle if you do have notes. And Cindy, did you get your notes? I hope you did. Uh, Cindy's my buddy. Uh, Debbie didn't get notes either. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys. I need I need everybody's email to make sure you get notes. If you sign up on my website, if you look in your email, you may have them from the website, arministry.net. If not, send me your email through my email, and I'll put you on the list, and I'll start sending them out individually. All right. The transformation growth cycle, Colossians 1, 9 through 10, we develop knowledge of his desire for us. That's wisdom and spiritual insight. Then we walk and we walk at the level of growth we've attained. We, we seek to please him. We seek to do the right thing. We seek to uh, do what he wants us to do. And then as we're going and glowing and growing, we need more knowledge. Just as soon as you get up on your feet and you start walking, you know, the, the filling of the Spirit means to be in the moment, surrender to the Holy Spirit. When you when you take your life out from under the Holy Spirit, you commit sin. You, you take your life out to commit sin. Well, then you have to confess and yield yourself back to the Spirit. You know, confessing, confession without yielding doesn't accomplish much, doesn't do much. You confess, you're cleansed from that sin, but you're not back listening, following, being guided by the Spirit. That's real important. So you got to learn to yield. So you get up and you're walking and you're trying to live your life as a Christian now, and you're going to bump into all these problems and you need more knowledge. Well, hopefully we're going to get more knowledge today about how all this works. All right, point six. One of the most misunderstood aspects of the Christian life is the purpose for the adversities that God allows in our life. What's the purpose of this? Today in church, well, Ron talked about uh, Elijah and the widow and the meal and the oil and the bringing her son back. And there was a reason for it. For the, listen, he, he's made some great points. Talking about the famine, the it didn't rain. You know, he prayed and it didn't rain. That's a famine. Well, the famine didn't kill the woman's son. Famine didn't kill any of them. The famine was from God. God's the one that brought the famine, and it was for a spiritual purpose. So he applied that to the coronavirus thing. Listen, none of us caused that. I mean, I don't know who caused it, but I know God is, is deeply involved in it, and he's using it for many things in our life. One of those things is to flush out our fear. Everyone who's afraid of this, I mean, do you not remember who you are? Do you not remember what's going to happen if you catch it and die? You're going to be with the Lord. Now, who's going to argue against that? But we hold on, we hold on. We, the, 
The Bible says the fear of death, the fear of death is one of the greatest challenges in life. The devil uses it against us to keep us from even thinking about it. We don't even look at it. We look away rather than think about it. All right. We have health problems and we wonder why does God allow this in my life? I mean, how is this helping me be a better minister for the Lord to have health trouble? Uh, we lose loved ones, both young and old. How does this help me live for Christ? Relational losses, people go through divorce, infidelity, financial problems, unfaithfulness, addictions. How does that help? Well, these are the challenges that we have to grow. Uh, these are the challenges that we have to grow through. So let's read Romans 5, 3 through 5. So he says, and not only in, in verse 1 and 2, he's talking about having peace with God. You know, we've been justified, we have peace with God, and we rejoice in the fact that we're going to be glorified with Christ. That's one and two. In three, he says, and not only do we rejoice in the confidence that we will share in the Lord's glory, but we also rejoice in our adversities. You ever heard that before? You know, James counted all joy. We, re we rejoice when adversity comes. Now, you can say that to most people, and they'll think you're nuts. How is it that you can rejoice and be happy and joyful when everything's coming apart in your life? How can you do that? Well, if you believe Romans 8, 28, then you believe that what God's doing in your life is uh, uh, bringing growth. He's bringing blessing in the form of adversity. He says, knowing that adversity develops endurance. Now, your verse, maybe your Bible may read a little different, but I've been working on all these words. I think these are the better ones for me to understand. And endurance allows us to experience proof. It's not character, it's proof. And witnessing the proof of the power of God's promises produces confidence. That's hope. And confidence in God never disappoints. Listen, confidence in man does. Jeremiah 17, 5, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. Verse 9 says, I mean, verse 8 says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Maybe it's 6 or 7, but he says, And the confidence or hope in God never disappoints because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit was given to us. So let's look at this just for a second. If you've got Bibles, you should open them to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Verse 1 says we're justified by faith. This is positional peace with God when we trusted in Christ. And now we're placed into union with Christ, where we share all that he is and all that he has. Verse 2, we have gained access to the Father. Listen, once we were put into Christ, Christ is sitting at the right hand, and now we have access. We're literally in the throne room. We're seated in him. He's seated at the right hand. We're in him, seated next to God the Father. That's crazy. So he says, we have access. The word echo is a perfect active indicative. It means permanent access. It's a permanent possession. This access that we have to the Father is permanent. You're not going to lose that. And he says, this permanent possession, uh, this word access is the word uh, prosagoge, uh, and it means you when, you when this word was spoken, you were allowed to approach the king. This was access to the king. And now we have permanent access to the king, as Ron said today, the Lord of the living and the dead. And he said, in this grace that we now have access, permanent access in which we stand. And this word histomy means to be placed. You've been placed in this permanent place of access to God. It's a perfect active indicative, meaning to be permanently placed. So you have been given, you and I, when we trusted in Christ, were given our permanent place forever. You're already in that place. 
in Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, with access to him forever, permanently, never losing it. You're already there. Now, this is why people want to go to heaven, to be there and to, and to have full, full access to the access. So, now. Verse 3 says, and so we rejoice also in adversities because we know they develop endurance. And so he says rejoice, and this is the word of call, call, may means to boast or brag. So, you know what Paul boasted about? The cross of Jesus Christ. That's all. He didn't boast about how great he was, and he wanted to. <laughs> he was a, he was a uh, approbation-seeking hound, if there ever was one. You know, Paul wanted to be famous. He wanted to be known for being the guy that did more than anybody else. And he did. And he was, and he has been. Uh, God answered that prayer, but boy, he wanted it bad. So he says you can boast about this access and about, and about the adversities that God is allowing in your life. He says we boast or brag knowing that it's all for good. God has allowed it for good. That's the only reason for us to grow. Paul was able to rejoice when ad adversity hit his life, knowing it was for good. He's going to say that later, three chapters later, in this same discussion. In, in 828, he's going to develop that out. And he says the word adversity, slipsis, means it means the normal, as a rule, it means the normal difficulties of life. You know, Jesus said, in this world, you will have troubles, not persecution. Every now and then it means that, but mostly it means just normal troubles of life. And he says, these adversities, these normal troubles of life, develop something. And the word develop is really important. Kater Godzima, it means to develop under pressure. Are you under pressure? You go, oh, yeah, I'm under pressure. I feel pressure every day. That pressure is producing. It's meant to hammer. It's, this word kata means down, to put pressure on a downward. It means to hammer something out. You're being hammered out. God is hammering out the false things from you and, and putting the truth in you so that so we can live it out. Now, it means to produce an effect through pressure and struggle. So he says, rejoice in adversity, in the trouble in your life. All these things that keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. Listen, no amount of money is going to stop that. Win the lottery, it's not going to stop the troubles of life. I mean, your loved ones are still going to pass away. Your body's still going to deteriorate. I mean, you may be able to get better medicine to last a few days longer, but still, all of this is coming. These are things that are coming and coming and coming all the way to the end and then to the door of death. These are the normal, this is the normal journey for believer and unbeliever. It's just the believer gets to use it for growth and to develop and become stronger and become more at peace and more faithful and re rewarded in eternity. The unbeliever just suffers the whole thing and then goes to the lake of fire. What a terrible, you know, life's a bitch and then you die kind of thing give my French. All right. So he says, what does adversity produce? It produces who pomone. And it means to remain under the weight. It means to have the strength to stay under pressure. I mean, how many times have you been under pressure as a Christian in your Christian life, in some form of your life, in your work or your relationships, you've been under pressure and you wanted to bolt. You wanted to leave, but you stayed. And there was no other reason than you loved the Lord. And you knew that's what the Lord wanted you to do. You did it for the Lord. See, that's divine good. That's rewardable stuff right there. You did it for the Lord. And I know, look, we can always second guess our motives. Paul said, don't stop doing that. Stop second guessing even yourself. When, when we stand before the Lord, he's going to reveal, every, the light's going to reveal everything. And then we'll be rewarded based on our motives. So, the adversity is producing endurance, the ability to hang in there. And what endurance really is, is confidence. The way confidence is built, see, what he's saying, 
is that you use God's word. See, that's going to be the proof. You you use God's word in your life, and it in God and it proves out every time that God's going to honor it. So every time you trust Him to handle something for you, and you stick it out. And he comes through and you go, wow, he did it again. He did it again. It builds confidence. That's called endurance. So endurance is confidence that God has given his word and that he will move heaven and earth if necessary to honor it. So we stand firm waiting on him. That's endurance. Now in verse four, he says an endurance produces proof. This word dokime is from dokimazo, and it means, and dokime was something proven, something pure. And it was literally gold having been purified by melting and rendering a true purified weight and value. They took the gold, they took the ore out of the ground and they burned it. They, they melted it down in a crucible and they superheated it with bellows and everything, and it would melt it all down, and the gold being the heaviest of all metals would sink to the bottom and everything else to the top. They would scoop off all of the imperfections. When they saw their, when the goldsmith saw his face with, with no imperfections, he knew he had pure gold. That's dokime. The product is dokime. So adversity, we apply the word of God. It builds our strength and builds our strength and builds our strength. Because we see the proof. Listen, if this stuff doesn't work, who's going to keep doing it? The reason we've kept doing it all these years, and I know all of you here, I mean, we've done this year after year after year. The reason we do is because God comes through. If we begin to not honor his word in our life, and I know often we wonder what he's doing because he's not answered our prayer and things have gone on a long time, and we wonder, and, and so we have to accept that maybe we don't understand what his will for us is, but he always answers it. He always takes care of us. He always provides for us. He does what he does for his children. This is what produces confidence because we see it. We experience it. This is what proof is. Endurance produces proof. And then he says, produce, proof produces hope or confidence, more confidence. So, as we endure, waiting on the Lord to honor his word in our life, we discover that he always does. We become totally persuaded that he is faithful to his word, and that's the proof that we're looking for. Listen to 2 Timothy 1.12. For this reason, I suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed. I mean, Paul suffered suffered privation. He was a, he was penniless. He was in jail. He was about to be executed. This is second Timothy. This is his last writings. He's writing to Timothy, his son in the faith. And he says, I've come to the end of the road here. And he says, I'm suffering all these things, but I'm not ashamed for I know whom I have believed and I have been persuaded. Again, that's a perfect tense. And it means to be permanently convinced. See, our faith starts out very small, and we're back and forth with it, back and forth, fluctuating the double-minded thing. But as we begin to purify our hearts, as we begin to learn how to take off our old ideas and, and become pure-hearted, just having truth, then we begin to, and we begin to see God come through for us and honor his word, we just become convinced by watching the process. God's in it to win it, and he's he's on our side. We're on his side. So, now, the way I see it, other people see it differently. Adversity is not testing the believer's faith. The adversity is testing the believer's faith in the word of God. See, faith is what activates God's promise. God's promise is sitting there for thousands of years, waiting on somebody to trust it. As soon as somebody trusts it, it activates uh, the will of God in their life, and he honors it. So what's being tested is not me or where I am. It's, it's God 
God's word that's being put to the test. That's why when it when when we trust it and put it to the test in our life, it always turns out to be proof. It proves itself out every time. This is what adversity is for. Adversity is not, you know, I just don't believe that it's a test to see where I am in the Christian life. I think God already knows that. It may be a test to show me where I am. The test might be to expose for my benefit, for me to work on things, where my flaws and weaknesses still are, where I still hold wrong ideas that need to be removed. See, adversity exposes us. But it's not for God to see where we are. He knows where we are. So, sorry, Rhonda, I licked my finger. All right. Verse 5. He says, this hope, this confidence, this persuaded confidence in God's proven faithfulness will never bring disgrace upon us. This word disappoint means to bring disgrace. Why? Uh, uh, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts. And this word, katai uh, skunai, means to be dishonored or disgraced or put to shame. You know, how many times have you trusted in something that didn't turn out to be true? You ever been scammed? You ever been tricked when you believed something that wasn't true and you got taken advantage of? Of course you have. Anybody that's lived long enough gets goes through that. But And then you feel stupid when that's happened in your life. Well, that's what he's talking about. When you put your faith in man or yourself or human faculties or human dynamics, you get disgraced. You, you get disappointed, embarrassed, disgraced. But when you trust God, you don't get disgraced. When our confidence is in God, we will never fail or dishonor him or ourselves. He says, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts. The word poured out is, a, again, a perfect tense, meaning it has been permanently. It means all of God's love has already been permanently poured out in our life. This means you can't be loved by God any more than you want. God already loves you as much as he loves. You have it all. I need you to know that the moment you trusted in Christ, everything that you will ever need was, was imputed to you, it was given to you at that very moment. We're just now learning that it's there and learning how to access it, how to take advantage of it. See, we, we have to learn all that. So, all right. I am getting all these pop-ups. So, Let's listen to James. This, this is a sister passage. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. He says, Consider it pure joy, fellow believers, whenever you encounter different types of trials. What this means, this word encounter, means to suddenly be surrounded. It's the word that's used for the guy, the Good Samaritan story on the guy on the way to Jericho. He's suddenly surrounded by, by robbers. Well, that's the word. You're suddenly surrounded by all these adversities. You know, the car goes out and the washing machine goes out and uh, everything goes out at one time. And you're like, what in the world? And it's God allowing these things all at one time. And that's what he, he says. Count it all joy, fellow believers, when uh, everything goes crazy at once. <clears throat> Why? Because you know something. You know that the proving of your faith or proving of your faith in God's word produces endurance. Same thing. Endurance, when it has its result, because, you listen, you've got the word. You keep getting more of the word. You're putting it to, pro to proof in your life. You're trying to walk. You're trying to run. You're trying to live the Christian life. And this endurance carries you to the next level, to the next level, to the next level. And you keep growing. You keep developing. You get stronger, your witness is greater, your love is greater, your peace is greater, everything's greater. You keep going. You keep going. Because endurance, when it has its complete result, results that you may be mature, complete, lacking nothing. So there's adversity. Why do Christians suffer? Why does God allow adversity in the life of his children? He certainly doesn't have to. 
He certainly has the power to keep it off of us, to keep it from coming into our life. You know, and he loves us. You would think, well, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? I think there was a book like that one time, Robert Shuler. You know, the positive thinking guy. Well, listen, God allows adversity in the life of the believer because these are the challenges, the hills to climb by which we grow. Now, I, there's some there's some people like uh, the charismatics. They believe that if you if you think positive, you think faith, you claim the promises that you won't have adversity. Now, I'm not sure exactly how that works, or if that's what they're claiming to say. But any adversity comes, you just you just claim the promise and name it, and somehow the adversity goes away. I don't think so. I think there are some adversities and some difficulties in which God expects us to live with, to live out. You know, the guy that was telling me that for so long died of cancer. And so it's like, well, why isn't it working for you? So I, I'm just saying that adversity sometimes, just like in the life of Paul, you know, he got the demon that, that beat him up all the time. That, that, that didn't go away. He kept that. That was, a, that was a lifetime appointment of suffering for him, something he had to live with. Listen, people live with these types of things all the day with health issues, things in their relationships, you know, where, where people struggle with each other. And uh, you may have a child in your life that with whom you're not very compatible, that you don't talk well with, and you just struggle with them. And uh, there's a relationship issue there, and you wish that you could overcome it, but you don't know how. And it just takes both parties. They have to grow up enough to realize that they want that and then pursue that. And there's a lot involved in it. These are things we live with. Just that simple. So, now, principle number seven in spiritual growth. God's plan for our growth is a circular system continually supporting itself, offering us opportunities to continually to grow, to continually grow into the likeness. It's a circle. You begin here, you you step out, you branch out, and then you have to be resupported. You have to come back and be resupported. You know, the Christian life is hopefully two steps forward and one step back. Just like that. It's two steps forward and one step back. So you nobody makes only Jesus took only steps forward. And and he did. He didn't have any back steps. He always believed the right thing. He always said the right thing, felt the right thing, did the right thing. He was perfect. But God's plan for us is a circular system. But let me give you this examples here. For instance, we start off in the childhood phases the brephos and the napios and the pice stages, these little children. Uh, and we call, we say, Abba, Father. That's, that's like dad, dad, you know, daddy. And so we focus on the foundations of forgiveness. That's one of the first things that, that many people, see, especially people with lascivious trends who've lived a while before say, they're saved, they have to understand they're forgiven and forgiving themselves and, and realizing that they're forgiven in Christ, that's a big journey. So when they get that forgiveness, it's like, wow, what a weight off. Now, if you're, if you're saddled with an ascetic trend, you don't even know you need forgiving because everything you've ever done is just right. I mean, you've got it right. You, you follow the line, you follow the letters, and you're good to go. So forgiveness is not a big deal. Humility is a bigger deal. For the ascetic trend, so you you deal with with forgiveness of sins, both salvational forgiveness and then walking forgiveness from First John one nine. Ideas about reconciliation and eternal security, your new identity in Christ. See, this is your foundation. You get into the training stages. This is where you learn about the power system, the power of the Holy Spirit to enable you to understand. He reveals things to you. You, de you develop your spiritual skills. You put on your armor. You begin to learn to use the shield of faith to keep you from getting wounded. 
You know, you've got the breastplate of righteousness. That's that's your experiential righteousness. Or maybe it's your positional righteousness. I don't know. But you got the helmet of salvation and you got the, you know, the girdle of truth and all these things. These are different aspects of the word of God that that and look, there's no such thing as all of these things. These this is a, again, this is a metaphor. It's an analogy to the truth of the Christian life. So don't wonder how you're supposed to put the breastplate of righteousness on or exactly what it is. It has to do with the fact that you are righteous in Christ, and the more you grow spiritually and the more you live for the Lord, you become righteous experientially. The helmet of salvation protects your head. That means you're saved, you're secure, you're protected. So on and on we go. So, But you're in, in the training, you're learning to function. You're in the functional phase. You know, you've come out of the baby phase, and now you're ready to walk and enter into the game, to the, to the war of the angelic. You're ready to enter in and begin to function. So you're getting trained to function. Well, then you reach the adult stages. You start entering into the battle. You learn how to pray. You learn how to pray for others. You, you get yourself connected up to a prayer network where so-and-so sends a note and says, hey, guys, pray for me. I'm about to go and see the doctor. And you go, all right, Father, take care of so-and-so. You know, or, 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 you know, we're trying to get a loan, so pray for that, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, <clears throat> so you enter into the battle. You enter into intimate relationships. See, this is where in the adult stages now maybe you've been married, but now you're learning how to be married as a Christian. And you, you begin to realize that, we shouldn't talk to each other the way we have. We, sh we should stop doing that. We should stop snapping at each other and being mean to each other and saying hurtful things. And we should stop calling names ever. Married people don't ever call each other names other than sweetheart and honey. But so you talk about, you think about your witness. You, you learn how to recognize evil in the world. And boy, is that a journey. To understand what evil is, to understand that, I mean, can you look across our nation right now and see the things that are going on? Much of it's obvious evil. The violence and the and the just the, the illogical approach, defund the police. Are you kidding me? That's insane. See, this stuff, a lot of this stuff's insane, and that's one of the ways you know it's evil. But you study history. You understand what Marxism is. You understand where it comes from. Uh, and you begin to realize that some of the things that are being advocated are not just unhelpful. They're, they're definitely wrong. They're evil. So you learn to recognize evil. Uh, and finally, as you reach into the mature, mature stages, you begin focusing on, this is where, listen, you develop your foundation, you go into training to learn how to use your armor and you learn how to walk, how to confess your sins, how to get back up and clean up and move on. You learn how to develop momentum. You get into maturity and into the adult stages and, and you begin to function actually as a mature believer. You, I mean, as an adult believer. See, adult believers are the ones that start to take responsibility. They begin to to take their share of the load. They they begin to help at the church. You know, they begin to volunteer and do the things. They begin to pray for the missionaries. You know, or, or if they're gifted or they, they have extra money, they begin to give their money. They begin to make, they begin to give back to the Lord. This is the adult stages. Well, in the mature stages, you begin to focus on character. See, you put the armor on and you learn how to swing the sword and, and hold up the shield and do all these things and learn how to fight the Christian life. But one day God says, all right, I want to work on the person in the armor. Who's the person in the armor? So this is not just skills. Christian life is not just skills and coping mechanisms or defensive systems. You know, it's, it's about your person being connected intimately with God. And as God begins to challenge your beliefs, revealing your old beliefs to you, listen, it gets very personal because these are things often that have hurt you deeply that you don't want to deal with again. 
what you need to deal with again with the Lord this time. Instead of handling it on your own by stuffing it down into your gut, repressing it and denying it and pretending it's not there, now you let this thing, this monster back out and you let yourself feel it and you let the Lord be in there with you and y'all can slay the giant or do whatever needs to be done to resolve it. This is the mature statements. This is where you begin to apply truth to your own character and motives. Listen, especially if you have an ascetic trend that you've been living by, many of the things that you do won't change, but your motive for doing them will. You know, if you're still, if you're still making up your bed because your mama taught that to you, look, that's a, that's a wonderful habit, but you got to change the motive. You know, your mama's not going to come in and spank you now or get on to you. Now you got to do it for the Lord. You say, Lord, I'm going to make up this bed because I love you. So you get into total honesty. You get into total honesty in relationship. This is where you quit being afraid to confront people. You you learn how to, to, to be able to say no, say no to people. If you're still in a place where you can't say no, then, boy, there's work to do here. And I will try to help you. And the Wednesday night class will help you. Uh, we're in the, uh, the first stage of recognizing old man beliefs, the becoming aware stage. you got to start paying attention to what's going on in your thoughts. So what I'm saying to you is that, that each of these stages – requires more knowledge and more knowledge and more knowledge and you and you learn them over and over again and each stage supports the next they're stages they're cyclic stages within themselves that lead you unto this mature place and listen if you stay after it and you you don't give up and you keep going believe me it leaves you it, it opens up into a really wonderful life a really, i don't mean a life of prosperity it may or may not be a life of financial prosperity and the easy street. Some people have that. Some people have a work care in the world about their finances. That's fine. You know, so what? Who cares? Uh, what does it matter? Listen, all that stuff's promised. All that stuff's guaranteed. Everything you need is already give, guaranteed. It's there on its way now. So, now, number eight, God uses the normal adversities. This is thlipsis, as we said earlier. T H L I P I T H L I P S I S. Thlipsis. It's hard to say. God uses these normal adversities that come to all of us in life as the pathway to self awareness and the healing of the wounds in the soul. These coming adversities in your life and and as you age more things come about more things happen more things happen to you to the loved ones to the people that you care about to the situation in your life more just comes it gets bigger and bigger and bigger it's just the way it works and all of this all of this is part of the normal adversity that god uses in your life is your track. This is the track. The normal adversities. See, you got two tracks. One are the normal adversities of life, and the second track is your old man beliefs that must be removed. That's the second pathway that you follow. Now, you say, well, what about focusing on Jesus? You're focused on Jesus the whole time that you're following both of those paths. Our childhood adversities are foreknown and allowed. Now, you know, this is going to answer a lot of questions, and we may not get beyond this. Why did God allow what he did in my life? Why did God allow, you know, the person down the street to touch me and, and convince me to do naughty things? Uh, well, why did all that happen? And you know, why did God allow my father to die at a, when I was young? Why did he allow my parents to divorce? All these things that happened. Why did he let me get sick? You know, I was a child with cancer or whatever. I mean, you, I'm not saying I was. I'm just saying that, you know, all these things happen to all these people. God allows all these things. What if you're born in the poorest part of Africa? 
You know, I mean, you're a little baby in the poorest. You're living in the dirt with a belly out here. I mean, why does God allow that stuff? Why does God allow people to be born in, in, in these communist countries, controlled with no freedom whatsoever, persuaded to believe those that is the right way to live? Crazy. So God allows adversity in the life of every young person. And it, here's the point. All of this is foreknown and allowed for a purpose. All of it. God knows that we're going to misunderstand the purpose for it. No little child who has these things happen in their life is going to be able to encompass the mind of God, look at his perspective, and understand why God allowed these painful things. Nobody can do it. It's not possible. So these things are going, these things are going to occur. We're going to reach conclusions about those things, how unfair they are, how hurtful they are, how personally we're going to take it, how we're going to blame someone else for it instead of ourselves. And the things that we believe about what happened are the are, is what hurts us. It's what hurts us. These things are foreknown and allowed, knowing that we will misunderstand their purpose and react to them with false beliefs. God knows we're going to build a whole old man belief system. He knows it. He allows it. He uses it. Gives us the grace to overcome all of it. When we finally get to the end of trying to make the old system work, then God as we wake up and begin to learn the word of God, then he allows us to use the grace that he's given us to overcome every last bit of what the devil was able to do to us. That's victory. See, he's already won the big war. And now he lets us go through our own individual war, get damaged, get beat up, and yet recover and come out on top. Smelling like a rose. So, Let's see, six minutes. So our childhood adversities are what form us. This is what forms us. Now the positives do as well, but often it's the adversities, the hurt and pain that we go through when we're young that that influences us most. These are the things that we that we cringe, that hurt, that we have to block off and create uh, these strongholds. We, we build a stronghold around this pain and hide it away. Uh, we justify the use of that stronghold as if I can't allow that back in my life. I'll never let myself hurt that way again. See, that's people that can't love anymore because that's, that's called hardness of heart. When you don't let yourself love again, when you can't open your heart back up again and let yourself attach normally to the, the people in your life, I don't mean like you're supposed to attach to God. I mean, normally, then that's called hardness of heart. So when it gets bad enough, Moses allowed them to divorce. Now, the false beliefs that form as reaction to our adversities are the source of our soul pain and our misery. It's the beliefs that we develop, not the events themselves. Let me give you an example. Let's say, I mean, this is going to be a crude example, but let's say that uh, a couple, they're going together, they're young, they're going together, they're not married, and they have sex. Well, that's a sin, and it probably will cause, if they're people of conscience, they'll probably have guilt. Who knows? They may even feel really bad. But look, a marriage ceremony a commitment that's made before the Lord, and now they have sex, and it's and God says it's good. So it's not the act. It's not the act, the physical act of being together. It's what's in the heart. It's what's in the heart about it. It's what you believe about it. So these false beliefs that form as our reactions to the things in our life, these are the problems. It's not what happened. I mean, you can't control what happened, but you can control and you can change 
what's in your heart about it. The normal challenges of growing up uh, are, are what are going to lead us to understand how to deal with this. You know, what we're after here is once you go through this pain and this pain forms you, and, and maybe you didn't go through pain, maybe you didn't go through a lot of pain, maybe you don't remember You'd be amazed at how many people don't remember what they went through. They don't remember it at all. They blocked it out. And it's not like maybe some terrible thing happened. They just don't think about it. They don't know. So they don't really even know what happened. But we go through these childhood stages, and then we go through the normal stages of growing up. That's what I'm trying to say here, learning to interact with the world. And as we do this, all of these challenges of going to school and learning how to fit in. And, you know, I remember all the extroverts. They were just happy and they would love to be around. People like me, the introverts, we just sat around hoping nobody noticed us, you know. And uh, I don't remember speaking in the first grade. That's how quiet I was. But so you got different kinds of people learning how to interact and, and deal with life. And these are the challenges of that age. And then you get into the challenges of intimate relationships marriage, children, your parents get older. All of these normal things are all part of the plan. So we're going to quit here. Uh, we're going to get farther next time, I promise. I'm going to keep on whacking at this thing. and Hopefully this is helping you. Listen, if you have questions, please send them to me. Uh, if you want notes, if listen, please send me your uh, email to farosenbloom at gmail.com and I will send you notes. I will make you a list, and I will send you notes every time. I already send about five people notes every time I study. So if you'll send me your email, I'll send you the notes. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. We praise you. I pray that you take these things and, and make them sensible to us. Not just a lot of information that's interesting, but things that will actually change our person, our character, our beliefs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.